Okay, welcome back to Pacific Legends Unleashed. We were we were working on that over the last three weeks. Probably our worst attempt, but yeah. So uh, welcome back, guys. It's been a while. A um, few issues getting to the second episode here, but we've made it finally. What were our issues? Mostly laziness. Yeah, laziness was part of it. Yeah. Technical difficulties. School holidays. There's a few plugs that we couldn't work out. Um, the microphones weren't going. Yeah. A couple of tantrums. Yeah, we do struggle with plugging things into things. Mm. But we're back. We persevered. Episode two. Um, how did you feel about episode one? Like now that you've listened to it? Really good, actually. Yeah. Um, it was just, I really liked the way that I was pretty hard and fast with some of the facts. Right. They're pretty loose. Huh. Most of them were accurate, but some of them weren't. Yeah, I got a lot of negative feedback about you. Did you? Yeah. Who from? People. Give me their names and numbers. <laughs> um, no, I didn't feel like it was the worst thing I'd ever done. Like, I wasn't even filled with shame. Yeah, but you've done a lot of bad things. After it's true, yeah. Let's keep that out of it. Okay, this is not bad things we've done in our lives. No. This is Pacific Legends Unleashed. Yeah. A lot of people have been saying, we like the fact that you let your legends off, off the leash. Off the leash. Because there's a lot of podcasts out there that just keep it pretty pretty leashed. You hear a lot of feedback from people who are like, I'm interested in that podcast, I like the vibe, but leashed. Yeah, it's leashed. There's no, there's no kind of... There was a gap in the market and we just thought, well, let's just take it off. Yeah, we take have. it off the leash. We have. Um, so our mate Ryan made a good point, actually. Oh, um, yes. Because in talking about the name of the show, I've just been telling people it's called Hardcore History and hoping they won't notice. Okay. But he then made the point that your name is actually quite close to that of Dan Carlin. Yes. Yeah. So if there's any way that we could perhaps profit from that or... Okay. Yeah, I'm just happy to go for it. So Dan, if you could introduce yourself, just be loose with that last name, Dan Carlin. Okay. Yeah. I'll give it a go. Okay. Um, so what's happening this episode? Hi guys, it's Dan Carlin here. Yeah, that's pretty ambiguous. Is that yeah? Yeah. Okay, and um, we're on episode two of William Blythe. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you guys listened to the first episode, probably not. But if you did, you may remember that we're in Tahiti. Yes. You know, it's April seventeen eighty nine. It is. And the bounty has been in Tahiti for how long? Five months. Five months. It's been a sixteenth month trip since they departed England. Mm. A few of those months quite terrible. But five beautiful months. You'd, you'd think uh, 16 months away from home might be tough, but the lads are having a great time, aren't they? Have you seen their home? Yeah, it's pretty rubbish. I mean, UK. Garbage. Yeah, probably grey and rainy. Tahiti, sun, sunshine all the time. Yep, beautiful. sunshine and venereal disease. Beautiful woman. Yep, 18 of them had venereal disease. 18 women did. Yep. Okay. <laughs> how do you know, the, how do you know the, the numbers on that? It's just the statistics. I'm just calling it. That's unleashed. Like it is. <laughs> you, just, you took that one off the leash. Venereal disease is unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> so the boys, apart from that, the boys are having a great time. Um, they've all got tattoos. They've been like just enjoying life in paradise, except for old Willie Bly. Tiny little William Bly. He hasn't been having a great time. In some ways... You might think he's a little bit jealous because little bit jealous. All the all the boys are just over there on the island with their women. They're all tanned. They're muscular. Yeah, they've all got little tattoos. They've Small made a cars. made a wee club. Yep. Knights of Tahiti. He's not really part of it. He's not even going to take his top off. He's mm. keeping his shirt and his jacket on. Oh, he's a gentleman of the Royal Navy. Yeah. So, can't let your nipples out. And where we got to basically in the podcast is they've they've transplanted all the breadfruit onto the ship. And they're kind of getting through their mission. And now they just need to take that breadfruit to the West Indies. Mm-hmm. So it's basically time to leave. Yeah, let's get a move on. Okay. The boys aren't that happy about it, though. You know, they've had such a good time. Why would they want to leave paradise? No, and the memory of their time with Bly prior to Tahiti, not, not great. Not great. Mm. Not great. So that's where we're at. And unfortunately, Bly's starting this mission from the island in a pretty bad mood. He's been, he's been grumpy. He's been angry. And the record shows that Perhaps his anger is even more intense once they get back on mm. and start leaving. So they're, they're heading back to the uh, West Indies. And um, well, Fletcher Christian, our, our boy, he's taken a fair copping from, from William Bly on the way. His former friend. Former friend. There's a fair bit of anger towards him. Some, might, some say that maybe it's from the fact that Fletcher Christian owed him money from South Africa and still hasn't paid it back. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know when he, where he would have found the money to do that. Well, there's ATMs on... Tahiti, isn't it? Uh, not in 1789. Oh, yeah, forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. Even uh, there's a quote here that says, Sir, your abuse is so bad I cannot do my duty with any pleasure. I've been in hell for weeks with you. That was it. That's yeah, pretty good. Who said it? Fletcher Christian. To Bly. Yeah. He's been in hell for weeks. That's 
that's been cool. Wow. So that said, when they're back on the boat, on the boat. Okay. And um, anyway, as as you may know, as you salty dogs probably know, is when you're on a, a sailboat for a long time, you need a lot of supplies. Mm-hmm. So the the boat pops in there to the old friendly islands, aka Tonga, and they stop there to get some wood and some water. So Fletcher Christian, he's off there, he's on he's on shore, and he's he's looking around, and he's taking forever, right? Mm-hmm. Blows, Too long. Bly's like, what's taking so long? All he had to do is get some wood and water. So he sends Fryer on there to go to go see what's going on, and Fryer arrives, and basically Christian's surrounded by a bunch of natives that are pretty angry. You know, they're looking at him. They don't seem that happy. And um, Fryer's pretty shaken, but he helps Christian. They kind of sort it out. They get the wood and water, but unfortunately during this kind of moment, the grapnel, the little anchor, gets mm. stolen. And if there's one thing we all know about William Blyers, he hates thieves. He hates, he hates stuff. Hates getting stolen. Far out, he hates thieves. So when they get back to the ship, he's he's pretty fired up. And who does he take his anger out on? Fletcher Christian. Poor old Fletcher Christian. He says, "You damned cowardly rescuer! Are you afraid of a set of naked savages while you have arms?" Hmm. He had arms. Yeah. <laughs> so didn't they all have arms? Yeah, they had arms. They yeah. all had arms. I yeah. mean, it's pretty tough to collect water without arms, isn't you it? You didn't need much to get on a ship back in the day, but arms was definitely yeah. one of the prerequisites. And legs. Yeah. Legs and arms. That was that was what you needed. Anyway, so he's just giving him an absolute dressing down right in front of everyone. He um, calls him a hound. Yeah, that's the big one, eh? Yeah. Sorry if there's any kids listening. Yeah. That's unleashed. Hound, yeah. <laughs> once again, you've taken it <laughs> off the leash. So... Once he once he hears that the grapnel's missing, he he berates the entire crew, um, and one of the one of the sailors, Billy McCoy, a young guy, he kind of is avoiding eye contact, probably because he's a little bit scared of this little angry man. We well, probably you know can barely even see Blade. He'd have to look a long way down just to mm, get eye yeah, contact. Yeah, so he's looking up, let's yeah. say, and this this angers Bly even more, who says, "McCoy, I will shoot you for not paying attention," in the face. In the face. I'll shoot you in the face yeah. for not getting the right amount of eye contact. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? Well, that, then that's what Bly is like at this point. So that quote, I think, exemplifies pretty well mm. the situation for those on board. He's fired up. Mm. He's very fired up. Uh, so, you know, and in some ways, avoiding eye contact, like looking down, is a sign of respect. Maybe it's he was just doing that. Yeah. But not the way Bly saw it. McCoy it's... could have been, no. Yeah. So, as you can, as you can probably guess, Bly's just absolutely lost lost the plot a bit. He's just angry. He's not a happy man. And then another incident happens that makes it even worse. More thievery. When the boys were on Tahiti, everyone got a, got a little pile of coconuts because that was pretty available. And one day, April 27, Bly notices that his stack of coconuts that he got in Tahiti is a little bit smaller. He flies into a rage. He orders Churchill to get every single coconut from everyone. And then he questions everyone, where's my, where's my coconuts gone? Um, and unfortunately, the person that was on watch, any guesses? Was it Fletcher Christian? Yes. Mm. Yeah, Fletcher Christian was on watch. So once again, he's going to take most of the blame. Um, he accuses Christian of being the thief, and we all know how much Bly hates thieves, don't mm. we? Yep. He even says to one of his junior officers, I'll leave you in Jamaica. You will not go home with me. Yep. Imagine just leaving someone in Jamaica. See, you guys, shouldn't take them with coconuts. Yeah, if they didn't look out sharp, he said he was going to kill one half of them mm, at this point. You'd hope to be the other half, wouldn't you? I don't know. Which half is he killing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he's Top a, half. He's a weird character, isn't he? Yep. Old Bly. So Christian, being the good dude that he is, he wants to spare the men. So he admits that he actually stole the, the coconut. But Bly is not having a bar of that. Whether he did steal it or not, like we don't, we don't know, but he says... He owns up to it. Yeah. Whether he did or not, whether he was just covering for his men. So Bly's not having that. He orders that all the officers' alcohol rations are cut. Mm-hmm. There's no more getting on the lash. <sighs> getting on the getting He's leashed the them. He's, 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 he's leashed them. Mm. And as we know, better to keep them off the leash. Yep. All these legends. So Christian's kind of really just, he's had enough. He is sick of it. He feels like he's getting targeted. All the anger is getting put on him. He's left his beautiful wife, essentially, back in Tahiti. And he he says to Purcell, another guy on the ship, that 
he's thinking about building a little cheeky little raft. Oh yeah, and just getting out of there. Yep. Just I'm um, I'm going to build something and off. Sounds like a bad idea. Yeah, when you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean mm. and you're going to build a crappy little raft and just take off, mm. probably a suicide. Probably mission. I think that might reflect his state of mind at the time. But he's obviously just I'm done. He's had enough. Anything yeah. but the ship. Yeah. And uh, well, Bly did call him a rascal. Yep. So what are you going to do? I'd probably get on the raft too. Yeah. Yeah. A hound, a rascal. Yeah. All the big ones. A cur and a wretch. So basically, when once Purcell hears this, he's kind of like, "That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard." <laughs> yeah. In my words, that's yeah. probably what he said. And I think he goes and talks with a few other people, and they kind of try and help Christian see reason. You know, if you build a raft and get out of here, you're going to die straight away. Mm. So they are unsuccessful with with convincing Christian to not do that. So they decide. Maybe they'll help him. Yeah. Well, if he's not going to listen, we may as well help him die. Mm, yeah. And that's where I'm going to pass over to you. Okay. And um, you're going to take it from here. Yeah, I can do that. So first things first, I just want to have a brief little rundown of one of the background characters in our story so far. Yes. So it's kind of an extra. Um, he's got a little bit more screen time than the rest, but he doesn't have that much, you know, that many lines of his own, and that okay. is Alex Stewart. Yep. If that's even his real name. Great cricketer. Yes, great former captain. Mm, yeah, we'll keep it. So this is Bly's description of the man of Alex Stewart. Twenty-two years old, five feet five inches. That was pretty average height for the time. Brown complexion, brown hair, strong made, pitted with smallpox, like they Ooh. all were. So now you've got that picture in your head. He was from London. Um, he was an orphan, and he'd been raised in poor houses. So he was just sort of put to work. He had food and lodging, yes. um, and he probably had a. Slightly less than legal life in the lead up to jumping on the bounty. Okay. When he did register for the bounty, he gave the name of Alexander or Alec Stewart. Probably because he, under you know his real name, had either deserted a ship or was wanted for some sort of other crime. Mm. So he just thought, you know, I've got to, can't give my real name here. I need to do something else. Bit of skullduggery. Yeah. Um, so his real name was John Adams. Ooh. And... That name, Adams, is a little more well-known to history, at least in the context of this story. Okay. So from this point on, Alex Stewart will be known as John Adams, and he's going to become um, a bit more of a central character as this story develops. So while in Tahiti, John Adams was one of the first to get tattooed. Along with Fletcher Christian, they got that star on the left breast. They were the Knights of Tahiti. And Adams formed a pretty intense relationship as well with um, one of the most beautiful local women, second only to Christian's Isabella by all accounts. So if we look at his experience in kind of general, he had that very intense positive experience in Tahiti. He was an orphan. He had no family to go back to in England. He had a pretty shady past, as evidenced by the fact that literally everyone who knows him now knows him by a fake name. Um, and he was also flogged really severely by Bly. So there was a little gudgeon that was taken while he was on watch one day. Um, and he was blamed for that, despite the fact that he thought anyone who had been on watch would have, you know, not noticed as well. The thief just was too slippery and got away. But Bly flogged him in front of the entire crew, all of the Tahitians, and Adams resented that forever. It just burned inside of him. So he's going to become, like I said, a, a more significant character in the story as we go. But back to the present moment. It's the night of April 28th, Ooh. 1789 off the coast of the Friendly Islands. So picture this, if you will. The water is flat. There's barely a breath of wind. The moon is all alone in a cloudless sky, probably reflecting off the water. Beautiful. It's, yeah, it's pretty serene anyway. Um, and it's sort of just that perfect calm before the storm. Perfect mutinous weather. Yeah, Christian, you know, he's grappling, I suppose, with his inner demons at this point. Bly's constant torment of him. He's really struggling. Like you said, he's been in hell for weeks, which is a terrible situation to be in, especially on such a small boat. I don't even like going to hell for the weekend. No. And he's been there for weeks. Yeah. And, you know, is he really going to cast himself adrift in the Pacific Ocean on a tiny raft? That's all talk. That's it? quite the thing to wrestle with anyway. So he tosses and turns. He's trying to get just a moment, a brief moment of restless sleep before his watch begins a little bit later. And in his quiet, probably moonlit cabin, he just hears this one voice, a quiet whisper, and it's John Adams in his ear. And he says, the people 
are right for anything. It was John Adams in his bed. I think so. It was cold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a wee spoon with it. Just whispered. Yeah. It's John, go back to sleep. No. <laughs> this. Uh, He's obviously snuck in, has he? I don't know. Invited, maybe. Yeah. It's hard to say. Historical sources are unclear. But okay. they're both in the cabin together and. John Adams says the men are right for anything. The people are right for anything. Mm. So that little whisper, it turns into a bit more of a, it's like a a booming voice in Christian's tormented racing mind. And he Mm. starts to think, actually, instead of casting myself adrift to get out of this horrible situation, why not cast Bly adrift? Why not take the ship? That's a way better idea. So it's 4 a.m. Christian starts his watch and he cautiously sounds out the vibe among the crew. And Fitzsimons, who's that Australian author we pillaged from in the first episode, he notes, perhaps coincidentally, maybe this is serendipity, fate, every man on deck at that time has been flogged by Bly. I mean, who hasn't? But at least everybody there has some sort of grudge. Yes. So after a few quiet mutterings with some of the crew, and imagine Fletcher Christian, his heart would be thumping in his chest. He's, you know, he's starting this topic of conversation, mutiny, with people, and he doesn't know if they're loyal to Bly or not until the conversation has been had, and all it would take was one to turn on him. So he has this conversation, and at the end of his wanderings around the deck on his watch, there are nine that he has managed to convince to join his cause. So yeah, we've well, got ten mutineers, including Christian, at this point. Good numbers. Yep, and they've got a pretty good idea as well of what they're going to do. So rather than Christian being cast adrift, like I said. Bly and three, and at this point it's only three of his best mates, are going to be put in the Bounty's jolly boat. It's a little 16-foot cutter, but it's made for calm waters, little lagoons, not for the open ocean. Sounds jolly. No, not at all. But they're not going to kill anyone. That's good. Yeah, Fletcher Christian's a gentleman, remember? Nice. So he's not just going to yeah. you know, turn to murder. If they're going to take the ship, though, Christian and his mates, they need to get into the arms chest. Like we said. Yeah. It's hard to do anything without arms. Yeah, so I, I don't know whether they've perhaps taken arms from people as they've sailed around and put them in the chest. Yeah, okay. You may need more at any point, you never know. Do re- you think they mean guns? Uh, that's not how I read it, but okay. now so that you point it out. That would make more sense. In the it. context of what I'm about to say, it does actually make more sense. Yeah, that's why I'm here, for, okay. the, for the cold hard facts. Sometimes you're the resident expert. Bly... Um, Bly, at least, he's demonstrated he's probably not going to be convinced by casual conversation. So maybe pointing an arm or a gun, whichever one it is, at his face will probably do the job. So Fry is known to have a couple of pistols too. They need to get those off him. A bit of a problem though, because the arms chest is currently being slept on by one of the sailors, someone who's not in on the plan. And <laughs> imagine his back. If he's yeah. sleep, sleeping on a chest. I'm just thinking of those chests with those big curled, curved lids. Yeah, I don't know if he had a bed. I don't know if it's where he chose to sleep. He must have, like, spider bifida. (laughs) That's probably why he sleeps there. It's therapeutic. Chiropractor says, look, if you can find something (laughs) chest-shaped, sleep on it. Anyway, the key to the arms chest as well. We've got one guy who's, for some reason, sleeping on the chest, and the key to that chest is with somebody else, and neither of those two men are in on the plan. So that's a bit of a dilemma. We've got an Ocean's Eleven sort of situation Mm. on our hands. They're going to have to pull off some kind of... Heist. Yeah, so to read through this heist, I think the best way to do it, I'm just going to quote again from Fitzsimons. Now, he combines primary sources with a bit of a flair for the dramatic. Yes. So he's an Australian accent. like us. A little bit, although he uses more facts. Mm. Yeah. As Christian ponders what to do, even as he goes below and ponders the sleeping form of Hallett, apparently on the chest, a sudden alarming cry is heard from on high. Has their plot been discovered? There's a shark on the larboard quarter, comes the cry, which, come to think of it, is perfect. A shark. Putting his hand on Hallett's shoulder, Christian shakes him. Hallett comes to with a start. Being asleep on duty, and on the chest, is an offence punishable by a good flogging. But no, strangely, Christian is smiling and saying something about a shark. Come and see for yourself, Mr Hallett. It's just been spotted on the larboard side. See if you can perhaps catch it. Hallett, fascinated, and hungry as a sailor on three-quarter rations, is on his feet in an instant and heads up on deck, trailing closely behind Christian, to see if he can find a way to catch the shark. He immediately comes across Midshipman Hayward, who is holding a shark hook and looking over the gunwale, intent on the same thing. Do you see the shark, Burkett? Hayward asked able seaman Thomas Burkett, who was busily scrubbing the deck. No, sir, I have not seen it forward. 
replies Burkett carefully, even as, over Hayward's shoulder, he can see the mutiny getting underway. For here now is Mr. Christian, followed closely by Mr. Churchill and a slew of others, heading down the fore hatchway, and Burkett hears Mr. Christian say to the armourer, Coleman, give me a musket to shoot a shark with. Of course, Mr. Christian. So, Christian and his, his band of merry men. They've got the arms. They've got arms. Hey. They've got arms. Let's go. Yeah, and he's, like in some ways, I suppose, he's a bit of a Robin Hood character at this point, rebelling against this oppressive authoritarian regime, yeah. helping out the common man. Yep. I like it. Yeah, he, I mean, he's also a little bit like a guy who's just been told that he can't hang out with his girlfriend anymore. Yeah. And, you know... His dad, he's trying to steal his dad's car so he can go and see her. His dad doesn't even understand what real love is. Yeah, that's fair enough. Or what good music is or anything like that. I'm on his side. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So Christian and his band of merry men, if you want to think of them that way, they've got muskets, they've got bayonets, some cool cutlasses, um, and a little bit of additional swagger in their step. Plans coming together. That'll help. Swagger. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you're on a ship. It'll make it a whole lot quicker. Absolutely. One of the reasons I invited you onto this podcast Comments like that. Comments like that, but also just your deep historical knowledge. Can you explain for the uh, listeners, the many, many listeners, yes. what a cutlass is? What does it look like? Well, <clears throat> a cutlass is like a sword that's bent. <laughs> yeah. It's curved, some yeah, might say. Yeah. Yes. It's got a big handle, like a real cool handle that protects your your hand from, this, from the blade. Yeah. Only one side is sharp and it's got a little point on the end. Okay. If you've ever seen a um, Pirate, Pirates of the Caribbean, you've probably seen a cutlass. What about Aladdin? Are they cutlasses? Yeah. Okay. They were also cutlasses. You actually knew quite a lot about cutlasses. Yeah. Yeah. I did a whole diploma in cutlasses. Okay. <laughs> so they've got cutlasses. Um, and the would-be mutineers, you know, now that they've got weapons, they're very close to being actual mutineers. Mm. And many of the men on the ship, at this point, they face a dilemma. And there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of moving parts. But they need to make a decision really quickly. Are they with Christian or are they not? And Christian and his mates are moving about the ship. They're subduing some people. They're offering partnership to some others and basically bullying others as well into submission. Like, whose side are you on? Tell us now. Yeah. You've got to make up your mind. So Christian leaves enough of his men on deck just to retain basic control of the situation in case those who maybe are still loyal to Bly flare up. Um, and he goes below decks with five or six of his more rascally, cowardly companions. Okay. It's about quarter past five in the morning. It's still. Christian and his men stand before the two cabins of one tiny little man and one normal-sized man as Fryer. Okay. So Fryer still has two pistols in his cabin. They have to get those. And just John Adams as well, he's at the back. Remember, he sort of started this. He was cuddling Fletcher Christian Mm. and just whispered sweet nothings in his ear. We're ripe for anything. So only a couple of hours ago, it was him that whispered into Christian's ear. He's now standing at the back, guarding this party who are about to push into Bly's cabin. And imagine the intensity of that situation, like for the men in that moment. Yeah. They'd left, you know, nearly a year and a half earlier together. Yeah. How many left at the beginning? 45? Yep. Yep. And a couple of them died. Valentine died. No big deal. No. And Huggin, I don't know if we told her, but he died. Did. Yeah, Valentine died due to Huggins' incompetence and then... Cook, dead. Cook, dead. Yeah, very much like Cook, they're both dead. So they've survived together, you know, some of the most intense and frightening open ocean conditions that you can imagine. Walls of water towering above them. They're being buried by hail, sleet, snow, the worst conditions, raging winds, ice. And Bly always got them through that. And he always had a fire burning. So when they came off their watch, they'd go below and all of their clothes could be dried. They had a hot meal. It was one of his rules. And none of that helped. You know, not the hardship, nor Bly's moments of genuine leadership or compassion that he did show. None of them could counterbalance the intense sort of acidic rage that he constantly exhibited. And angry, it just, angry man. Angry little man. And it just ate away at the, at the sailors. They couldn't do it. Plus, they really missed hanging out with hot chicks. Yeah, on that, must, that must be part of it. Yeah, it's hard to say the ratio exactly. So Christian standing in front of Bly's cabin, no doubt memories flicking through his mind of bouncing Bly's daughter on his knee and, you know, eating dinner with his wife and their long friendship together. They just shared so much. Yes. Including coconuts. Mm. And 
here Christian is the decision maker. He's got the choice to make. And so he takes a deep breath. Are they ever going to see their families again? No. Dawn's just breaking. So the darkness is not, it's not complete. You can imagine little murky shadows moving about. Christian takes that deep breath. He centers himself. He twists the handle and he pushes into the captain's cabin. So it's Christian Churchill and Burkett standing over Bly's bunk. And Bly wakes up to the noise. He's like, Wait, what's going on? Um, he doesn't get any verbal response. So he says again, like, hey, what's the matter? What's happening? Christian, ice in his veins, responds super coolly. He says, Bly, you are my prisoner. That's pretty cool. Doesn't call him captain. Just Ooh, Bly. Huge. Yeah, so it's a, you know, the, the, the sense disrespect. Of, yeah, the disrespect is evident. Christian, he just dismisses rank. Christian tells Bly that if he makes a sound, if he utters one word, that he will cut his throat. What do you think Bly does? Uh, punches them in the face? No, not that dramatic, but he does just start screaming at them. Huh? Classic Bly, he just calls Christian's bluff. And Christian's not going to cut his throat. He's not that dramatic at this point. Um, Charlie Churchill, a bit less of a gentleman than Christian, though, so he just smacks Bly in the head. Yeah. The blunt side of his cutlass. Nice. Shut up, mate. Yeah. He's dead. Yeah, good. He might have said that. I probably would have done the same. Yeah, Christian says, oh, oh, hang on, steady on, we don't need to go that far. So he stops Churchill from laying further into the captain. Um, they get some rope, they skewer Bly's hands. They probably should have gagged him, because he's still just absolutely going off at them. Potty mouth has been unleashed yet again. So would you say Bly's got no arms now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rest of the mutineers have them all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So while all this is going on, Fryer himself, he's been apprehended as well, pistols taken. And Bly's led above deck. So just as dawn breaks, um, Charlie Churchill's cutlass is stabbing Bly in the back as he's he's barely clothed. He's um, one of the... And his nighty. Yeah, one of the men pulls his nightshirt down just to preserve his modesty yeah. as he's lashed to the mast. But he's not going quietly. Um, he's challenging anybody who looks at him, despite the very real threat that they pose. You know, they've got muskets, pistols, they've got bayonets. They're all trained right on him but he's screaming and one of them says we should blow his brains out and he just taunts them he says well, classic, hey. classic call yeah yeah totally. blow his brains out rip his head off exactly and Bly just dares them to do it he's like fire fire you ungrateful wretches I dare you um Briar then appears on deck you know, he's trying to cool the situation down he tries to negotiate with Christian and just says look why don't we just put Bly below decks for a bit let this whole situation simmer down a little um, but he doesn't get much purchase on that idea. Christian's not keen. He's come too far already. It's kind of all or nothing, isn't it? It basically is, and he knows that. Like, Christian's got um, a deep sea lead tied around his neck. It's underneath his shirt. So if this all goes belly up, he's, he's just, just going to go to the bottom of the... Yeah, Davy Jones. Yeah. He's just going off. So it is all or nothing. So Fryer's attempts to negotiate are um, fruitless. So... Fryer says the, the jolly boat's half eaten with worms. If you put him in that, they're just going to sink. So can you give them something different? Um, Christian, you know, he's he's described at this point. Morrison, whose journal is a key source of evidence for this, states that Christian's um, hair was messy. Can you believe his shirt collar was open? Oh. Yeah. Like it's usually done up. Outrageous. And now it's open. So he's an absolute lunatic, but it's also stated that Christian's eyes were, and this is Morrison's words, flaming with revenge. Well done, Morrison. He's a good writer. Yeah, I know. That's very evocative. But the whole time, Bly's just making mental notes. He's checking who's with him, who's against him, who's got swords or whatever. So he's cataloguing, you know, the um, actions of all of the men who are on deck at this point. And the following exchange is based on a couple of different sources. So Bly's log, Morrison's journal, and some of the court-martial documents too. So Bly asks Christian, What is the reason for such a violent act? Christian apparently responds by roaring wildly, Mamu, sir! Not a word or death's your portion. He says Mamu. Interesting. Yeah, how's your Tahitian? Oh, uh, really good, yeah. The Mamu means... Um, I don't actually know that one. What does it mean? That's probably the one you don't know. Um, it means silence in Tahitian. Ah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. did, did Bly know Tahitian? Well, he'd been there. Okay. I think he probably knew enough enough probably of the basics. Could have just said silence. Yeah, but, I mean, don't you think that's a little bit telling in oh, this moment? Geez. Just as Christian's cracking, maybe it's a Freudian slip, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's a window into the unconscious. Mm-hmm. Do you want to know a good joke about Freudian slips? Sure. Um. Yes. 
A Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but mean your mother. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, because of a mother. Yeah, thing. I, I get that. Yeah, I get. It. So all the while, Bly is just calling them rascals and curs and wretches while all this is going on. And Bly apparently offers Christian his silence. He's like, I won't tell anyone. If I get back to England, I won't tell anyone what you've done if you just call it off now. He's definitely the kind of person that would do that, eh? Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. But Christian just says, you know, like, if you had any honour to begin with, it wouldn't have got to this point. So I'm hardly going to believe what you're saying now. I'm hardly going to trust you right now because you're a man. He's basically saying, blow it out your ass, Bly. Yeah. Well, that's a bit unleashed. Yeah. I would... I thought we were allowed to do that. No, that's good. I like it. More of that, actually. More of that. Yeah, okay, we should yeah. swear way more often. Yeah, okay. Um, Off the leash. Cole and Purcell plead with Christian to be given the long boat rather than the jolly boat or the cutter. Um, and, you know, eventually they rely on their goodwill with Christian. They've helped him out before. They knew about his plan to build the raft. And so finally Christian says, fine, you can have the long boat. And that's... Generous. Yeah. And so we're at the point now where everybody's... You know, on deck, Bly and his cronies are being put into this boat and you're going to tell our devoted, numerous... Listeners. Yeah, listeners. What happens next? What happens next? Just one question before we go into that. Go on. Probably one of the more important crew members, one that you really want to get on side, mm. is Blind Fiddler. Yeah. What's he been up to? So, <laughs> He was um, he was put in the jolly boat, I think, originally. Like, they put it in the water, and it started to take on water. So he was the first guy put in the I boat. think he was, yeah, he, I think he Quick, was the first one put in the water. grab the blind fiddler and throw him in and see if he sinks. <laughs> yeah, and while all of this other chaos was going on, and then they put, you know, the long boat in there, I think that they just forgot about, for, what was his name, Michael Byrne, <laughs> so you're the fiddler. Me, you're telling me that... They've left the jolly boat in the water with the blind fiddler who mm. doesn't know what's going on because he can't see. Yeah. He probably just got out of bed, thinks it's a normal day. Yeah. Sitting in the jolly boat. I think that's what Floating happened. away. Yeah, and everyone forgot about it. <laughs> that's yeah. something out of a cartoon. Yeah. Well, that's apparently what happened. Mate, you can't do that to a blind guy. Poor guy. And here I was being on After Christian's all, side. he'd fiddled with the men so many times and they'd just forgotten about him immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess he couldn't see, so... Okay, so it's April 28, 1789. All the boys are in the, uh, in the long boat. So with the final count, there's 22 loyalists, 20, 21 mutineers. It's like an even split almost. Mm. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, so Christian managed to convince half the crew to join his course. When they originally were only going to send three plus Bly. Yeah. Yeah. Ramped up. So they put 19 of them into the long boat. That's including Bly. And small boat, it says it's long, but it's not made for that many people. Unfortunately, there's not enough room for all the loyalists, so three of them get left behind. Mm-hmm. Poor old blind fiddler. Yeah. Still in the jolly boat. Oh, no. He doesn't know any Slowly better. Slowly sinking. Mm. So, <clears throat> Bly's uh, led to the launch. He exchanges parting comments with Christian, attempting, attempting to make him feel guilty for all the kindness that he's offered him, even the fact that Christian has bounced his daughter on his knee. Yeah. In Bly's own home. Yeah. And uh, as he climbs down the ladder to get on the boat, he says, Never fear, my lads. I'll do you justice if ever I reach England. Big, big chat. Fighting words big. from a man who's essentially being led to death, put mm. down into a, a death boat. Yeah. So luckily, <clears throat> Christian has the, the goodwill to give them some supplies. You know, he gives them a compass. He gives them a sextant. Mm-hmm. And he gives them some food. Yep. So they've got a little bit of stuff. They also get four cutlasses. They do ask for arms. <laughs> I mean guns. They ask for guns. Right. <clears throat> but they don't get them. But they do get four cutlasses. So, they, you know, they've got a little bit of stuff. But meagre supplies, middle of the Pacific Ocean. If you didn't know, the Pacific Ocean is pretty big. It's large. 19 men. Yeah. And the, the longboat's like pretty low in the water because it's not designed for that kind of weight, the supplies, all the men. Mm-hmm. The sextant. The sextant, yep. There's nowhere to go, really. So, it's not looking great. <clears throat> and anyway, um, off they go. <clears throat> the end. <laughs> they all live happily ever after. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe this, but just as they're paddling off, <laughs> a shark emerges. <laughs> what? <laughs> this, is what it, this is what it says. A shark emerges from the deep. Right. And bites off a paddle. 
buy itself a pedal. Yeah, okay. So That seems overly dramatic. Well, it says. Okay, well, if it says it. <laughs> so that's what's going on. Is they're in their boat, they're pedaling away, and to add insult to injury, dead set shark rips off the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then disappears back into the deep. <laughs> and then... Quite satisfied. Yeah, okay. So they're off to Tofua, back to Tofua, because they know the supplies there, right? Mm, they've been there before. They've been there before. They've pretty got. They've got mega supplies on their ship. Yep. Their little long boat. So they need to, need some more. And maybe even the natives will be really nice to them and give them a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. even though it didn't work out so well last time. Yeah. So off they head there. They get there pretty quickly because they weren't that far <coughs> away, and <laughs> and the natives appear. Bly tells them that the ship has sunk. <laughs> he's trying to keep a straight face while he's telling them this grave news. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, the ship sunk. So he's really hoping he can do some trading. The crew go on, goes on a foraging mission and they, um, they find a bunch of supplies. But as they're doing this, some more natives appear and then more natives and there's canoes coming in and suddenly there's a whole ton of natives, 200 natives armed with 200 spears. That's one per person. Wow. Yeah. So it's, <clears throat> the situation starts to remind Bly of what it was like when Cook died. It does sound eerily similar. Yeah. So Bly says to everyone, you know, keep calm. What we're going to do is we're going to wait till nightfall and then we'll make their escape. But the situation deteriorates further. You know, there's hundreds of, hundreds of natives circling the sailors and they're starting to hit the rocks together. Just like with Cook. Clack, clack. Clackety clack. Yes. Clack. That is spooky. Bly knows the sound and he knows it well, but he remains calm. So what they decide to do is they just they decide to like slowly work their way into the launch and get out of there. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> they jump on the launch, but just as they're about to leave, they realize it's still attached to the anchor on the shore. Mm-hmm. That's a big rookie oversight. error. Big oversight. Yeah. The quartermaster John Norton, <clears throat> what a brave dude! He's like, okay, I'll go get the I'll go get the anchor so we can leave. He runs onto shore to grab the anchor, and he gets stoned. He <laughs> completely neglects the mission. <laughs> just sits down. Probably not the time to be doing that. Off at a pipe. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I missed the line. You get stoned to death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> stoned to death by the indigenous warriors. So, <clears throat> poor dude. He's, all he was trying to do was get the anchor out of the sand so everyone could leave. Yeah. Takes a rock to the head. He, yep. The joke was on him, though. Because they cut the rope anyway. Right. So they didn't need to do that. So they put him up to it. Absolute pranksters. What a waste. So poor old John Norton, he's dead on the beach. But luckily, everyone else is in the in the in the long boat and they're rowing for their life to get out of there. But the natives jump into the canoes and start chasing them. Bly comes up with a really good plan. He thinks, you know, <clears throat> when we do our trading, you can get a, a breadfruit plant for a button. Mm. So imagine how interested these guys would be with our clothes, our shirt. We'll take off our shirts. Ooh. We'll throw them into the water. That's hopefully big for him. That, hopefully that will give off, um, get them off the, their pursuit. Fly's nipples unleash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he hasn't taken his shirt off in no. six months. And there he is, bare-breasted. <clears throat> so the gambit is working. In a choice between killing the Englishmen or gathering their, their garments, the natives have decided the latter is more precious. So they stop to get the clothes before they sink to the bottom. Mm-hmm. Luckily... The crew on the longboat, paddling for their lives, managed to get away. And it starts to get dark just as this is happening. They get the sail up and they get out of there. And they're pretty, pretty stoked to be still alive. So, Except for Norton. <clears throat> he's not alive, yeah. He just never got stoned. Much like Cook. Yep. So they're, they're away, <clears throat> away from the island. But after that experience, they're all pretty shaken up. And they've kind of accepted that, hey, you know, these natives that we once thought were really friendly are no longer that welcoming to us. There's no way we can be stopping in at any of these Pacific islands. Yeah, in any of the places where we took hostages and... Yeah, I don't know why they're so upset with us. Yeah, how bizarre. So, Precious. unfortunately, they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and there's no land around them apart from these islands that now they're no longer willing to land on. So Not so friendly. It's a pretty, it's a pretty dicey situation. Um, there's thought about going to Tonga Tapu, but again, there's a bit of disagreement. Fry doesn't think they should go. Cole supports Fryer, so Bly decides maybe we need to think of a different option. And they come up with 
New Holland. Mm. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Or Timor. Okay. Yeah. That's the other option. And uh, Timor is 4,000 miles away. Right. Bly thinks he can make it happen. Of course he does. Yeah. He, <clears throat> he obviously thinks it's going to be hideously di- difficult, but uh, it's probably their best option. It's their only hope because in, in Timor... There's this place called Ko- Kopang, mm-hmm. and um, there's a Dutch settlement there. And they think if we can get to if we can get there, then we can get to another settlement called Batavia, which is the capital of the Dutch East Indies, and there'll be ships going from there back to England. Mm-hmm. So that's our only hope. So Bly, who's ever practical, he does a quick stock take of the rations, and he works out that <clears throat> if everyone lives on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day. We've probably got enough food to last us eight weeks. We might be able to make it to Copang. Mm-hmm. He did the mess. The men, the men agree with that. <clears throat> Fire's particularly impressed with his, uh, his planning. And the launch begins its 4,000 mile journey to Timor. Remember, this is a long boat, right? It's not made for open ocean. Absolute death it, sentence. It's made for like harbors, bays, getting from the big boat, mm. from the bounty into shore. Yep. And suddenly these guys are launching themselves across open seas. So on their way, they get pretty close to Fiji, <clears throat> and Bly pulls out his charts, pulls out his bits of paper. He manages to chart Fiji for the first time in history, but they resist the uh, temptation to go ashore because of the last experience they had yep. on Tofua. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, like it's pretty horrific conditions, massive waves, Bly shows a lot of ingenu- ingenuity. He uses canvas around the water, around the boat to keep the water and the high waves out. And he manages to keep everyone kind of on side by giving them small, small amounts of pork and a single teaspoon of rum when the times are tough. <clears throat> so it's pretty, a pretty amazing experience. Incredible resilience. Almost no sleep at all was being had. And... There's constant calculations being performed at all time to try and keep them on course. It's one of those situations where, like, when the situation is at its worst, Bly is at his best. Yeah. Like, he is just on 24-7 at the peak of his game. And what the most amazing thing is, like, they're out there in these massive waves. Like, I've been out there on a cruise ship, in, which is massive, right? And when there's waves Bad out there... for the environment? The the whole the whole boat just gets rocked. Yeah. Right. Like side to side. But imagine that on a little boat. Mm. You're getting absolutely spanked. Even worse. Yeah. So. <clears throat> did you have a sextant on the cruise ship? Yeah, I did. Okay. I got it out and navigated for the crew. Very good. Yes. So, on May twenty eighth, seventeen eighty nine, the launch makes land on Restoration Island. This is off the northern tip of New Holland, right? This, the Northern Territory. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> this is the first time the loyalists have uh, touched firm ground in 26 days. They've Ruling covered, days. They've covered 2,500 miles, and that's about 90 miles a day since mm. they've been adrift. So they've been out there just getting smashed on a tiny bit of bread and a little bit of, a little bit of water and occasionally a teaspoon of rum. Yep. And somehow they've made it to land. <clears throat> but they're not safe yet. There's... Because there's nothing there. There's no, you know, there's no civilization. There's no, there's no food. There's a little bit of, they've managed to find some oysters. No civilization's a bit of a... <clears throat> well, there's no cities. No, no roadways. <laughs> there's no, no highways. No. They're, there's the indigenous people of Australia yeah. are, <clears throat> are around, but they see no sign of that. Yep. Right? Yeah, so they're off just, the coast. Yeah. So it's just the middle of nowhere. And there's a fair bit of like... There's a little bit of tempers fraying here. Bly threatens Purcell with a cutlass, um, and Fryer and Bly are always butting heads. Yep. Um, so it's interesting because Bly writes a, a list of loyalist names that he is certain he can trust, and the two people that aren't on there are Purcell and Fryer. Hmm. But you know, you've been a sh- you've been in the ocean for 26 days. Of course, you're going to be getting angry with a few people. Yep. Anyway, they carry on um, all the way through Endeavour Strait, which is kind of like the top point of Cape York, above Cape York and Papua New Guinea. They go through the Endeavour Strait all the way, um, which is amazing navigation, right? 
Yeah, lots of shallow areas and yep. a lot of reefs and small islands. They get all the way through there, um, and then they, eventually they see Timor. And Bly and Fry are hating each other at this stage, which is not surprising. Um, Fry kind of questions Bly when he thinks he sees Timor, but Fry believes it's a collection of islands. Bly flies into such a rage that he pulls his cutlass out, just like he did on Purcell, mm. and threatens to stab him. And in June 13th, 1789, Bly and the launch are in the waters just off Timor. They, they run into a native who they get to come aboard that they see on shore, and they get that, the native to act as a guide so they can get through all the reefs because it's pretty tricky navigation. And um, <clears throat> Bly actually shows a little bit of generosity here. He, he goes double allowance on, on bread. And even a little wine. Wow. Now that they can see the, <laughs> see the they, end finish or the finish line, they can splurge. Yeah. And then the next day, June 14, they arrive in the town that is Copang. What's interesting about Bly is <clears throat> he's all about the appearances that they make like a Union Jack flag out of scrap material because even though they've been on this little boat for days on end, they're still, it's still important to look the part, yep. play the part. Yeah, he's still a proud sailor of the British Royal Navy, and he's intent on displaying it. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> forty-seven days, four thousand miles, made it all the way without losing a man, apart from except old for that guy, John Norton. Norton. See you, mate. Well, that was his own fault. They didn't need to. Yeah. He didn't need to get the anchor, did he? Survival of the fittest. And they consider this one of the great ocean journeys of survival. They like it's. Comparable to Shackleton and his boat. Yeah. Like it's unbelievable how they survived that. And that just shows that Bly, he may have got a, he might, he might have a short fuse. He might be an angry man, but he can definitely navig- As a seaman. navigate a boat. Yeah, he knows yeah. what he's about. It's interesting they get to Copang. You know, as, as you would understand, the people in Copang have got no idea what's going on here. What's this bunch of raggedy crew? Yeah. People look like they haven't. They haven't eaten or like had a shower in years. Why is that man so small? <laughs> Just rolling in on this long boat. Mm. Like, where are these guys come from? So, pretty impressive stuff. Um, they're all a bit, they're all a bit worse for wear. So it takes a fair bit of just recovery. And the, once they get there, Bly's got one objective, and that's basically to get back to England so he can get some justice. Yep. So once they spend some time um, getting their kind of health back, Bly is looking at purchasing a schooner so he can sail to the bigger the bigger city of Batavia and from there catch a ride to England on a Dutch ship. While he's in Copang, there's still a fair bit of arguments going on between Purcell and uh, and Fryer and Bly. It's all a it's all a bit uh, all a bit tense. Well, there's still some tension as well between Bly and Fryer based on. The ship's expense books. Yes. Right. And Fryer's trying to actually, like, <clears throat> Fryer tries to put him up for he's been cooking the books. He tries yeah. to get him in trouble. Yeah. Doesn't really, um, which is real interesting. You know, you've just survived the most amazing thing, and you, it seems really petty. Yeah. But nothing really comes of that. What's interesting is now that they're in Copang, one of their crew dies, David Nelson dies of a fever, and Bly takes his death pretty hard, as you would. You've probably bonded pretty hard on this crazy journey and he was one of the botanists i think yeah and suddenly suddenly he's dead but eventually they kind of like they get it all sorted um they get themselves around to batavia in their in their schooner and then uh <clears throat> eventually Blythe finds a ship to get himself back to england and the interesting thing about Bly is that even though he's not the captain of the ship as it's heading back to england he's constantly up there Standing next to the captain, yeah, telling him what he should be doing and making sure he knows when he makes mistakes and yeah. why I wouldn't have done that. So it just shows like what sort of person he is—a compulsive perfectionist and <laughs> yeah, control freak. He's a guest on a ship that's yeah. being taken back to England after a horrific experience, and all he wants to do is Nitpick. make sure that the captain knows that yeah. Bly's a better navigator than him. Yep. <laughs> what a. What a dude. It is hard being better than people, though. You know? Like, how do you... Yeah. 
kind how, of carry yourself and how do you make sure they know that exactly you stand, without yeah. you stand next you stand to them, them and say you're three degrees say, off i wouldn't have done that yeah i wouldn't have gone that way but uh what an amazing journey you know christian and the others on the on the bounty probably thought you know these guys are dead yep shark there's, food they saw that one shark <laughs> pop up immediately they and they're lost like the well, straight away they're not yeah. they're not going to survive and yet here they are all the way to to Copang. yep and beyond and back to England. Yep. Justice perhaps going to be unleashed. Yeah, unleashed. Interesting thing though is that when uh, Bly jumped on his boat, he left most of the most of his lads behind. Mm-hmm. He was just like, "You guys will catch a boat later on. I'm just going to jump on this one. There's only one spot, and I'll take it." Yeah, yeah. I'll see I'll you s- later. I'll see you in England. Yeah. Whenever you get here, all the best. Thanks for the journey. Yeah. So that was pretty um, selfless of him. Well, he's on a mission. He's got to get yeah, back. Yeah, he's got to go get. Go get these mutineers. Yeah, court martial. He was personally wronged. Yeah, fair, fair. I'm going to pass it over to you now, Benjamin. So back, I guess, with Christian and the bounty. And the bounty sets sail. They chuck all the breadfruit plants out of the great cabin. See you, Bly. Yep. And they basically go in the opposite direction to Bly's little boat. Um, but they're not headed directly for Tahiti, which may surprise some. That's surprising. Yeah. They set a course instead for Tubuai, which is a small island. It's about 600 kilometers from Tahiti. And Christian's got a plan. So they're going to Tubuai because they want to establish a base of operations there rather than Tahiti. They want to prepare that site for a settlement, get a food and water supply sorted, have a nice home set up, fire roaring, then go to Tahiti and get some people to take back. So they don't want to live in Tahiti. Yep. Tubuai's stop number one. So on the 28th of May which is exactly a month after the mutiny, which was the 28th of April, Christian drops the bounty's anchor just outside the reef, which surrounds um, Tubuai. Yes. And a canoe of mostly naked women comes out, and they think... How good. Perfect. Yeah, business as usual. We're clearly welcome. It's a little bit of a trap, though. They've been pranked. There's also a war party coming at them from the opposite direction. Great prank. Absolutely. It works. And Christian, like he's the captain now. He's got all of the boat's resources at his disposal. So he sees this war party coming. Um, what would you do in that situation um, as a trained seafarer yourself? Probably and... get the cannons out. Cannon, yeah. yeah. So he got the cannon out and shot the cannon at them. Yeah. Yeah, so it's loaded with grape shot. They just... Grapes. Murder multiple people. So this grape shot just rips through the bodies. The water's turned red. Yeah. And Is that from the grapes? I, the I don't know. It, it doesn't say. Okay. So it's not a good introduction to Tubaway, though, regardless. Oh, nice. Here's a cannonball to your head. Yeah, it's not a good introduction. So any hope of a peaceful sort of societal integration or assimilation, that's completely dashed. And if you're an inhabitant of the island and you've seen that happen, all of your grapes just be shot by a cannon, Yeah, you would probably retreat, you would probably hide. And that is exactly what they did. Huh. So Christian decides maybe this is not the best place for them, at least not right now. So they weigh anchor and they go to... The Promised Land. Back to Tahiti. Tahiti. It's June the 6th, 1789, so eight weeks after they originally departed Tahiti. It's now Christian's bounty rather than Bly's bounty, which returns to those familiar golden shores. Yes. And that whole time, so from the 28th, the day of the mutiny, through to Tubuai and then onto Tahiti, and they get there on June the 6th, that whole time Christian is tormented by nightmares mm. he is racked by guilt you know a guilt that eats away at him as much as Bly's anger had ever done and the crew when they get there they're cr- greeted by this familiar flotilla of canoes so you know overcome with joy to see their friends returning again the Tahitians come out and they're you know greeted by their lovers John Adams and his lover you know throw themselves oh, into wow. each other's arms Good. and their beds and Yep. Venereal disease is unleashed yet again. And um, Tyner, chief, though... The chief must be confused. Yeah, so Tyner's got questions. His first question is, hey, where's Bly? Where's Christian, the guy? Yeah, where's that tiny little... What was his name? But Christian tells Tyner that Bly reunited with Captain Cook. He's like, no, we found him when we were sailing around in the Pacific Ocean. They, they just chanced upon each other. And that's probably rare, that kind of thing happening, eh? Yeah. In the Pacific. Tyner, you know, somehow he buys it. Or he appears to at the very least. So he goes, okay. <laughs> and the crew are welcomed back. 
and they're welcomed back to the extent that Christian marries Isabella, his sweetheart. Yes. And a few other um, sailors marry their Tahitian companions as well. So everything's basically going perfectly at this point. Yes. It's a rather fluid and flexible plan, um, but it's going well. Christian, though, still having his nightmares. He's Uh. still struggling to throw off the guilt that's sort of surrounding him after the mutiny. It's these nightmares that he has that kind of prompts Christian to announce his intentions to the crew. The bounty cannot stay in Tahiti. It's a known location. You know, if Bly ever got back, then the first place they're going to send a ship to look for the mutineers is Tahiti. They cannot stay there. And there's probably other ships popping through, is it? Yeah, every now and then a ship would pop up. It may not be British, you know, it might be Portuguese. or the word will get around. Absolutely. People would know. Um, But Christian was paranoid. He thought that Bly might have even made it back to Tahiti or one of the neighbouring islands already, even though that's completely impractical. There's no way that he could actually do that. Christian was paranoid. He was terrified that that was the case. China started to sort of mull over the finer details of Christian's story, and he starts asking pretty pointed questions at this point. He understands that Bly is supposed to be returning to England with Captain Cook because that's what's happened. They met up and they're like, oh, cool, we'll go back to England and Christian, you can set up a new settlement somewhere in the Pacific. Yeah. That's his story. But Ina goes aboard the bounty, Christian's bounty, and he notices that the gifts he gave to Bly, which would be delivered to King George, are still sitting there. Yeah. And he flies into a rage at this point. He's like, wait, we had a degree of trust. You know, I thought that these were going back to King George. He's very keen to make that sort of friendship between himself and the great king. Yeah. Um, and he thinks that he's being disrespected as a result. So. Christian tries to calm him down. He says, no, 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 it's fine. We are going to do that. Um, But then he's upset as well. Tyner's also upset that they're going to leave Tahiti after he's, you know, after Christian has married Isabella. So Christian's almost in a position where he can't win right now. Um, And he knows they have to get out of there pretty much immediately. Yeah. But he can't do that completely alone. Um, Fitzsimons writes about Christian during this period where he's, you know, absolutely struggling to, to stay sane. And he states, The state of Christian's mind worries the other mutineers. He is so frequently depressed they even worry about leaving him on his own. And it is found that only the soothing ministrations of Isabella can lift him up from his remorseful reverie. And a lot of the mutineers are not keen to leave Tahiti, and for all the same reasons as before, except, you know, now the bounty isn't there either. They don't have a mission to carry on with. So yeah. all those same trappings are there, but there's also, you know, a little bit more freedom. So they don't want to go out to sea again, especially not if they're just going to wander for who knows how long to find this imaginary paradise that they're, going to, be able to, yeah, that they're going to be able to stay at forever. Um, Christian's still got a bit of his old charm, though, you know, some of his old smile, the, the twinkle in his eye, and he's able to get the men, so all of the mutineers, plus 28 Tahitians, so that's nine men, ten women, eight boys and a, a young girl on board, and they sail away from Tahiti to Tubuai. Back to Tubuai. Yeah, so that's the place they'd left, you know, absolutely just boil with rage after they turned up, shot them with a cannon, took off again. They'll forget and forgive. Yeah, I think so. They probably don't even remember. They arrive back in Tubuai, and they do manage to broker a really uneasy sort of truce. But it turns out there's not just one tribe on the island. There are three, and they are constantly at war with one another. So it's a... Turbulent situation. And long story short, um, you know how I don't really like to go on and on. I just sort of cut to the chase. Yes. Yeah, Christian and his men attempt to build a fort there on Tubuai. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't go well. Skirmishes continue to break out. Uh, then there's a full-scale war. So the you know local disagreements escalate to the point where Christian and his mates, they make a bit of a fighting retreat from the fort that they've partially built. And in the process of doing that, they kill a lot of people. So they kill about 60 natives of Tubuai in this fighting retreat away from the fort, back to the, to the bounty. Um, 15 of the 25 mutineers, you know, they sit down and they go, well, what do we do now? Where do we go? What can we possibly do? Well, 15 of them wanted to return to Tahiti and stay there. Yeah. So that's it for us. 15 say, we're going to Tahiti and we're not leaving. Take us back there. And so they go. And some of the people from Tubuai go with them. They're curious about the world. Um, you know, they're from the tribe that they were allied with, loosely allied with, so they jump on the bounty as well. September 21st, 1789, the bounty returns to Tahiti again, 
Again. But it's going to be a quick stay because Christian needs to get out of there. Yeah. And as depression is concerning to the men, um, Haywood, the young guy, recounted that Christian was generally below leaning his head upon his hand, and when they came down for orders, he seldom raised his head to answer more than yes or no. So he was barely functioning. You know, he's yeah. just overwhelmed by guilt and the pressure of command. Uh, two days later, um, after returning to, to Tahiti, so it's the 23rd of September, Christian is on board um, the bounty. He didn't want to go on shore to Tahiti again, and he just cuts the rope, tying the bounty to its anchor. So nice. it's night time. Power move. Absolute power move, but they've got a number of Tahitians who are just sleeping on board. They came out for a party. Um, Massive night. Yeah, and, but he just takes them all away. They're just on board, and he f- just feels like, I have to go straight away. Cuts the rope, tying the, the anchor to the ship, and that's it. Whoever's on board at that time goes away, which is kind of weird and a bit kidnappy. Yeah, a little bit. But he's got to go, so what are you going to do? So it's Christian. There's eight other mutineers. There are 19 Tahitian and Tubawayan men women and children, and they're trying to sail the bounty to a permanent place of refuge, some sort of safe haven. The promised land. Promised land, if it exists. Um, it's mid-November, though, of 1789. Christian and the bounty still have not found a home. They go to Tonga Tabu, but they're advised that Cook um, had previously visited the island, so they can't stay there. It's obviously chartered. Yeah. The Navy knows about it. Yeah. So Christian spends weeks poring over the charts and the books that Bly's got in his library. Yes. And he had a pretty comprehensive collection because that was his whole thing, cartography. Oh, he loved it. He loved it. And he decides upon Pitcairn Island as the perfect location. Pitcairn. So, why, why, is, why is that perfect? Well, it can be found on Admiralty maps, um, but Cook was using the coordinates that were put on those maps and he couldn't find it. Like Even Cook could not find Mate, it. Mate, if Cook couldn't find it, exactly. no can find it. Yeah, when he was alive. Could he find it when he was dead? No. But that seems to suggest that the recorded latitude and longitude are, are probably incorrect. Um, as far as Christian knows, though, like no Europeans ever set foot on Pitcairn. Huge. Yeah, it's just way off the beaten track. It's two miles long. It's, you know, one and a half thousand miles away from Tahiti. It's perfect. But they just have to find it. Yeah. So more than three months since they finally left Tahiti with a lot of uncertainty and tempers fraying, you know, the men who are all mutineers, maybe their loyalty to the captain isn't quite as resolute as it would usually be. It's probably not working out as they hoped. Absolutely not, especially because he just took off during the middle of the night from Tahiti. Did he leave any of the mutineers on Tahiti? Yeah, some, a bunch stayed. So most of the 15, I think all of the 15 who wanted to stay there, stayed there. Okay. Yeah. And can you give us an update on the blind fiddler? Uh, he stayed there, didn't he? I have absolutely no idea where he is. I think he's still in the... Jolly boat. Jolly boat. Yeah, it's just slowly sinking. It's just him and the worms. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, Christian and the crew of the bounty, the trust between them is at breaking point. So Isabella keeps, you know, waking up night after night. Fletcher Christian's just coated in sweat, desperate to try and find this place, but feeling like he's never going to do it. And he's haunted by the, the terror of what he's done and what Bly might do. And he's convinced that Bly's going to get back to England. So they're all desperate for the situation to end. On the 15th of January, 1790, a small, tiny little smudge appears on the horizon. They're all peering over the deck. The promised land. Well, at first they can't be, like it could just be a cloud on the horizon. Could just be a cloud. They can't tell straight away. It could be a trick of the light. Okay. But they get closer and no, they can see clearly now a volcanic peak. It just soars yes. up out of the ocean you know, a thousand feet straight up and that mountain falls away and there's dramatic cliffs and they can see the lush greenness of that, you know, the volcanic soil which just promotes such verdant growth. And Christian and his misfit, you know, they're a multicultural crew. They rejoice. They're clambering over the rigging. They reef the sails. They drop the anchor in the the deep waters that surround Pitcairn Island. Oh, massive. The... End for now. Okay, so the mutineers have made it to Pitcairn. Yep. Fly's made it back to England. Has he? He has. Okay. <laughs> he thought he was on the Dutch ship. But... Why? Yeah. He helped the captain navigate his way back okay. to England. <laughs> they made it in record time with Fly's help. Right, he's on the way, yeah. Yep. But um, where does the story go from here? Uh, well, it doesn't go much further in terms of the, 
Christian and Co. Pecan yep. is really going to be home for them. Yep. Um, We've got some interesting stuff happening. But yeah, Pecan explodes. It, it just turns into the craziest story of <sighs> intrigue and backstabbing, murder. Oh, um, love that. It's wild. At the end of it, only one of these men are going to survive, the men that are with Christian. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just one of the most incredible stories I've ever encountered. Uh-huh. Well, tune in next episode on Pacific Legends Unleashed. Unleashed. Ha, ha, ha.